Hello, my beautiful friends all over the country and the world. Thank you very much for pressing play on today's program. I've got the great Dr. Christina Greer, political scientist of Fordham University, joining me. She is always a treat to talk to, and today is no exception. Very excited that she joined me and for you to hear our conversation. I always learn a lot from Christina. I learn a lot from everybody I talk to, for sure, but she just always gives me insights and perspectives and thoughts that I've just really never heard of or thought of, and I love talking to her and love having her in my life. I think you're going to enjoy this one. I'm taking the week off of the news and the news segment as I prepare to head out to Las Vegas to tape the show live in front of a live audience in Vegas on Saturday at Pod Jam. We'll be performing stand-up comedy and music at night, and I'm so excited that so many of you are venturing out to join us in Las Vegas this week. But I've got great guests that I'll be posting all week long, including a couple of first-timers. Education journalist Laura Papano joins me to talk about the Moms from Liberty movement, this extreme far-right movement that I'm dealing with in my town and what we can do about it. Talk to clinical psychologist who works almost exclusively with adolescents for the first time, Dr. John Duffy. Fantastic conversation coming your way with him. I'll be talking about Haiti with Haitian relief expert Brian Concanon. David Rothkoff is also set to join me. And who knows what else I've got up my sleeve. But for those of you that love the news segment, I'm sorry it's not here this week. I'm taking a little break from it as I get ready to head out west and work on a few other things. To have a few loose knots. Went to see Julia's first freezing cold day lacrosse game on Monday. It was fantastic. She did great. So happy. She's back on the team, and the season has started again. I just love to watch her do anything, and especially play sports. It's not something she did as a young girl, so it's been a real surprise and a real delight, and she's really enjoying it. All right, well, let's get to my guest, Christina Greer. She is associate professor of political science at Fordham University. Her research and teaching focuses on American politics, black ethnic politics, urban politics, quantitative methods, Congress, New York City, and New York State politics, campaigns and elections, as well as public opinion. Her book, Black Ethnics, Race, Immigration, and the Pursuit of the American Dream, was published by Oxford University Press. I met Christina when someone got drunk and booked me to sit next to her on a panel at MSNBC, and then again and again, and I don't know why she likes me, but I love talking with her. She's the host of The Blackest Questions, which is a lot of fun, a great little podcast at The Grio, as well as co-host of FAQ NYC. You can read her writing in all different kinds of outlets, and I'm always happy when she joins me. We covered a lot today and, as always, went off on a few fun tangents because that's what we do. We had some laughs. We did a little lightning round at the end. She's always great, and I'm so happy that she joined me again. I hope you'll follow her on all the social medias, listen to her podcast, support everything everything that she is doing. Let's do it right now with Dr. Christina Greer. Let's get yeah. to some of the things <laughs> that you're an expert on, but that other people are not experts on, but people listen to them. That's the dilemma. You were talking about this on MSNBC a couple of weeks ago. I spoke with our friend Jason Johnson about just this issue. You're a PhD. You're a professor. You're a writer, an author, a historian. And then there are other people who are comedians or pundits or disc jockeys or whatever, but they sometimes, like me, get platforms and people listen to them. And Mm -hmm. they're not necessarily right. And at best or at worst, they're very wrong and dangerous, damaging. What are your thoughts on that in general, the Imbalance. Yeah, I agree. First of all, I'm not a historian. And the reason why I'm being specific, is like I'm a political scientist. So like some conversations require a historian and I'm not that. Well, sometimes when people are like, Chrissy, you're a journalist. I'm like, I'm actually not a journalist. Like journalists have a certain code of ethics and like a skill set that I just don't have. So it's not that I don't feel like people can expand their lane, but there is a certain element of staying in your lane, especially when we're dealing with I would say, I know we say it every four years, because every four years it becomes more and more true. This is the most important election of our lifetime. We do have a Republican candidate who essentially will get in office and he said, I ain't going because I don't want to go to prison. It's going to be my personal fiefdom. He had a practice run on a whole bunch of things in the smash and grab. And now it's just, oh, now I know how to go thieving and I won't even (laughs) deal with the party because guess what? I'm just going to put all my family members in the party. Now my daughter-in-law is head of the RNC. We're watching this stuff in real time that other countries have done and we're pretending that it's not happening. And this goes back to my theory of white people not understanding white people or the capacity of white people. And that's like a whole podcast episode in and of itself. But I think 
So many celebrities have platforms. And listen, I'm not one of these people where when athletes speak out about things like shut up and dribble. I fundamentally love when athletes are like, hey, social justice, let's have these conversations. I do think, though, when it comes to electoral politics, we're seeing a disproportionate number of celebrities, dare I say black celebrities, who are just parroting. And a friend of mine is working on a, a popular piece about this, and I'm working on an academic piece. Look at this possible oh, shift of black men to this more conservative element because black people ideologically are very diverse. We're just trapped in one party by and large. But the infiltration of platforms like that right. we saw in 2016 and 2020, where it is proven that Russia was like, oh, OK, if I can get black people like disaffected, it's not like you're necessarily going to get them to vote Republican. That's a, a wish. But it's if I could just get them to stay home, that's a win. And they did that by creating accounts that appeared to be black people, just some Russian yeah, asshole. Yeah, and then just this kind of my vote doesn't matter. We should stay home. These right. message boards and things like that. And then you have people who have very large platforms, millions of listeners, whether it's their podcast or their radio show or they're just an entertainer and people buy their music and listen to them interviewing real people, like real candidates and having a seat at the table. And I'm like, how? What are you saying when you get to the table? It's musings. You have zero idea as to just how important your words and pontifications can be for the millions of people who are following you. And you haven't done the research. You haven't done the work. I've literally dedicated my whole life to trying to figure out where black people fit in this country electorally. That is literally what I've chosen to dedicate my life doing. So I do bristle and take offense when some rando who's like a good rapper or a disc jockey gets to have a platform with presidential candidates and just have musings. And it's, I say Donald Trump is bad. See, look at me on these other platforms when I say it. And it's, no, I'm talking about when 5 million people are listening to you on a daily basis and you are slowly chipping away right. at voter empathy and apathy uh, and planting these seeds of voter apathy every day. And then, listen, the real problem is white people voting against their interests and voting for Republicans. That's the larger issue. Well, sure. sure but, but, but we do know that percentages matter. So if you tacitly, implicitly and explicitly imply that like your vote doesn't matter and people should just stay home, why do you think that black people were denied the right to vote for so many hundreds of years? Because right. right. voting is really important. Why do you think that we consistently try and keep the vote away from people? Because it's really important. So to get people to say nothing changes, it's really? Because guess what? Uh, lots have changed in the past four years because people didn't turn up and we got a Supreme Court the way we got it because that's based on senators who get to vote whether or not this person gets in or not. And if you didn't vote for your senator, here we are. Absolutely. It's, it's a whole vicious cycle. And I just I get really frustrated, especially every four years, because it's the same lazy rhetoric. It is. And the thing that bothers me so much, me personally, is that because I don't know anything about anything, I do at least you, try to prepare. You're going to say me, myself, personally. That, <laughs> that I say I know, that? No, I'm saying you got to say that. I know some of your listeners will appreciate that. Me, myself, personally. <laughs> and I try to prepare because I don't know. I try to prepare as much as I possibly can before I talk to a guest on my show. And mm -hmm. I just it irks me that somebody just because they have a huge platform We'll sit down with, say, the vice president of the United States and seemingly not like really prepared. It's like mm -hmm. how irresponsible you said lazy can you be and how much damage can you do by not knowing oh, wow. some simple stuff? And you just look stupid, too. But it it is without parallel and constant mm -hmm. that we see these types of folks doing yeah. this. And it's, you know what? Also, and I will say this is mainstream media. You go on CNN a lot. I go on MSNBC a lot like What's so frustrating is I go on CNN once in a blue moon. I did a little bit last month. They're allergic. And by and large, MSNBC too, obviously Fox is. But they are allergic to putting on scholars of political science. Mm. They have lots of lawyers on. But besides myself and Jason Johnson, who have PhDs in political science, who else is on the news talking about politics? We have a whole organization called the National Conference of Black Political Scientists. Now, of those hundreds of black people, not all of them study black politics, not all of them study American politics. 
but a very large percentage of schools and universities across the country. We all have regional specialties. Like I obviously know a lot about New York City and New York State, but like my California colleagues, they know a ton about the state of California. We've got people in the South. We've got lots of people who have been at Dartmouth or Utah. They can tell you about regional politics and also national politics. Like, why are they not on television? I constantly tell producers, I'm like, listen, I have a gaggle of people in my phone that I can call right now who are just as dynamic. They might not have as much experience on television as I do, but hey, the only way you get experience on television is by being on television. Yeah. But it's like Roland Martin does a great job at this. He actually has a lot of scholars on consistently. But the mainstream media, I'm like, why? No offense to pundits and journalists and lawyers, but you don't have degrees in political science. So There are theories that back up what I'm saying. And when I'm saying it, it comes with the myriad of books behind me that have helped me come to, it's not my opinion. So no, I'm not a journalist, but I I will say I'm more than a pundit, actually. Yes, absolutely. And that's why I I love finding those people and getting the opportunity to interview them. I even, I guess for my ego, when when they are obscure and I say, you're so smart and so good at talking and keep having them on and make them better. And then they... They go on and on. It's a a great thing to be able to help people, to platform people. And it's not that hard. Like you said, if if you want to find somebody, just ask. (laughs) You can just ask. That's the whole point. For any expert. Hiring committees where we can't find any black people to hire. And I'm like, really? Because I can actually go on my phone and give you 15 names right now. So I I don't understand how. What about cross-country skiing coach? And I really do want to hire a black person. Where do I go for that? There are some jobs. Yeah, the thing is, it's like, why don't you just <laughs> country listen, ski? I Never can country ski. find you, you know, five black lacrosse players in my phone. If I could, I did this. Come on, no for, way! I do did... you have five black lacrosse players in your phone? I won't bet you. A... <laughs> really? I five? Played I played lacrosse. Yeah. Okay, all right. Here's Maybe the thing. All you have to, you might have to do a teeny bit right, of research. Exactly. Exactly. But like, I gave this talk at Google during lockdown and they were like, we would want to hire someone, but we don't know someone. It was like someone who does X. Yeah. And I was like, that is the laziest shit I've ever heard yeah. because I literally opened up my phone and I was like, this person, there's their email, this person, <laughs> there's email. To be fair, and you I was do like, know everybody. Also, but also it's like, why am I doing your job? Right. Like yeah. your reflex is to just say, oh, I just don't know anybody. And it's really because you wouldn't say that. Yeah. For anybody else, if it was like something different. Well, the advice being given by people who really don't understand what they're saying is this perpetuating these ideas about uh, President Biden and his administration. You have this piece at the Grio that you wrote, which I'll share with everybody. The links in the show notes, the difference between a Biden voter and a Biden supporter and why both matter for the 2024 election. You touched on it a little bit already. And a lot of the reasons people give, I think, are because they're informed or misinformed by some of these lazy commentators that are doing really well at this point often and don't have that have lost touch to a certain extent, I would argue. Who am I to say? But you talk about how dire this election is. You mentioned that. But what are you hearing when you talk to black folks, black voters about their feelings towards this president and what he has or has not accomplished? Yeah, it's a mixed bag, which makes me really nervous. I'm talking to a lot of educated black people who are just not excited about this race. And I'm like, you do see who the opponent is. And they're like, yeah, but I'm like. No, but so it's like they're not saying they'd vote for Trump, but they'll they're saying they'll either leave the top of the ticket blank or they'll vote for some sort of third party candidate just because they're like, I just whether it's his international politics that they disagree with or whatever it may be. And I'm like, now we have a purity test for presidents and what they do internationally. Sure. But everyone has their cause. That is a I bit of a change. You wrote about that in the article that black, yeah, it's bo- like black folks didn't think as much about international Yeah, listen, we've always cared about international relations. Like, we're the ones who kept the apartheid movement on the table. A very large percentage of Black people have relatives outside of the United States, right? A very large percentage of Black people have relatives in the U.S. military and they're property of the U.S. government. So they have to go wherever the U.S. military is intervening, of which there are many places where we intervene on and off the books. So I get that. But at the same time, I'm like, but you do see the alternative. We had a sample of it, right? This man will sell our country for parts. I literally wrote that. And we know that he's had a dry run. So yeah, Joe Biden's old. But as he said in the State of the Union, which I thought was a great line, it's like, 
I may be old, but my ideas aren't old. Like I'm not trying to like go back to olden days. So someone said this, which I thought was really poignant. And she was like, listen, I'm not a Biden supporter. She's just, I don't get down with him. But she was like, I damn sure am a Biden voter. Hmm, Like the stakes are too high. I hold my nose. And I think right now we're just seeing a lot of black people who are like, I'm tired of holding my nose. There has to be a point where we like demand something from our vote because we feel like other people are getting things that we're not getting. I, I wonder about that, and I plead ignorance on this to a certain extent, but I think that all complaints from black folks about this president could be true of all presidents, Democratic presidents, yeah. certainly Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, and just leaving them outside of Republican presidents. But the idea, I, I feel like you could make a really strong argument for what the Biden administration has done policy-wise and personnel-wise for people of color across the country, and arguably more than almost any other president – and in yeah. history, of the, in modern history. Yeah. But here's the difference, Pete. I'm, First of all, the Democrats are terrible at offense and defense. One. Two, they are terrible at selling their ideas. Obama did the same thing. You do amazing things for groups and then you just you do it in silence, just assuming that somehow we'll miraculously know what you've done. The Biden administration. Three, they have done probably more for African-Americans than any president in modern history. Now, one, you have to be careful because obviously that'll make some people angry that you've done anything for black people. And two, it's just that they don't know how to toot their own horns. But you have the fourth piece, which I think is one of the most pointed pieces, which is Donald Trump says whatever the hell he wants to say, and he just keeps saying it. So he just says, I've done more for black people than any president in the history of the nation. And guess what? He says it every single day. And pretty soon, as with all the things that he says, they just somehow start to become they become his reality, and then they become the narrative. So I've done more for vets. This man has taken more money away from veterans than any modern day president. Like it's criminal. Same with old people and social security, the whole nine. But all he says is, I have done more for vets and old people and blacks, the, the blacks, as he calls us, than anyone. And it's like repetition becomes reality. And he's really good at that. The man is good at selling things. Is there any appeal that you've seen that is in any way a percentage of, say, black men, at least, I think we talk a lot about, that find some appeal with Donald Trump uh, at all? When I think when I talked with Jason, he says it's there, but it's not very significant. I don't know how you measure such things, but I still don't quite understand. I've heard different theories, but I, I haven't really seen anybody doing a deep dive on specifically black men and and how they may be changing their opinion or having an opinion of Donald Trump. That's the paper I'm working on now. But here's the thing. We'll be able to measure it November 6th, the day after the election. (laughs) But let me just give you the linear narrative, though. Black women, 95 percent, every presidential election, 95 percent of voting eligible black women. Right. Black men, roughly anywhere between 89 to 91 percent. Now, Might we see 87 percent? Might we see even 85 percent of black men voting democratically? So that means 15 percent now, not 9 percent, but 15 percent are voting for the Republican Party candidate, which, okay, if we're used to 89 to 91 percent voting for the Democrat and now it's only 85 percent, that is a move, right? That is a shift. I'm not saying that it's not. Especially in certain states where it could be really. Sure. In Michigan, Pennsylvania, Ohio, Virginia, Florida, that would make a difference. But let's also not forget that 55 percent of white women and 60 percent, like more than 60 percent of white men vote for the Republican Party candidate I, every but, but single I, time. But I feel and that's always worth mentioning, but I always feel like we know why they do. Why are we seeing a change? You don't know why? Women vote against their interests consistently with the Republican Party. They've only voted for the Democratic Party candidate twice in in modern history, and that's 64 and 96. But you don't. Here's the thing. I would say that this is what LBJ told us. If you can convince poor white people that they're better than Negroes, then you can pick their pockets. It's because the only thing that Republicans are selling them is whiteness. It's not you're not selling them gun policy, which is their their victims of. You're not selling them health care, which is no, they, they're taking they their health care the and they're taking their I mean, yeah. reproductive so right. Like, yeah, yeah, but they'd yeah. rather poor white people would rather have nothing than to feel like <laughs> yeah. black people have something. Right. And it's like, okay, guess what? You're gonna die with nothing. I have a job. I have insurance. And I'm actually voting to try and get your poor white self something. But <laughs> you would much rather yeah. die broke and ill just so I have nothing. But guess what? I do have something. 
I don't have whiteness, but I actually don't even want whiteness. That's the only thing that they're selling you. You've got guns and heroin and no health care. That's what you have. And white skin. Kudos. And no job, by the way. So it's this is what you all want to cling to? Okay. I appreciate that tangent on thoughts about white voters, knowing that's a very excellent way of distilling it. But getting back to the black vote and the Trump thing, can you explain that in any way? Listen, one, he's been around for a long time. People know him. Yes, Biden has been an elected official for a long time, but Donald Trump has been in black imagination for 40 something years as a success story. And so all he does is talk about how he's a success story. And so for some people, that is very attractive, right? The entrepreneurship that is very much there. This idea that it's, I'm not a politician. I get to basically be a free man, right? Free white man. But that is attractive to some people where it's, yeah, we can just, he's saying, let's just be free. Let's say what we want to say. Let's feel how we want to feel. This selling of ideas, which do not come true, but if you're listening to Donald Trump and ill-informed celebrities, you would think that actually he will create stuff for you. Right. He won't. Right. Like that little COVID stimmy check that you got that wasn't even his idea and wasn't allocated by his people, like all those things, it's never going to happen. Like all those tax breaks that he's going to give his friends aren't going to trickle down to you. But I think there's also an element of aspirational voting from some black men where it's just just the way the same way white people vote is you want to vote with who you feel like the winner is. Like any and he purports himself as I'm a winner. Now, granted, he can't decide who wants to be a victim or a hero, yeah. <laughs> but he does this like, yeah, because a lot of men feel men in general, men of all stripes, they feel like I'm a victim because women are taking everything. But it's also I'm a hero because I'm a man. It's like, <laughs> go to therapy and talk about it. Uh, but I mean, that's the root. Listen, I was a classics minor. Everything goes back to Oedipus. Is that Everything. right? Everything? Everything goes back to, did your mom hug you or not? I agree with that. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> that is just, I swear. I had too many, um, my, my, I had too many hugs. So that's why I went into comedy. I have that theory about comedy. If you didn't have enough hugs or you had too many hugs, my mom was very loving. Oh, was she one of those? And my like, dad. You, here's a blue ribbon. You're like, I didn't get a blue ribbon. It's like, yes, you yeah, did. Yeah, no, my mom was very much, yeah, gold star. Go, she said, go for the gold when she dropped me off at college. You said go for the what gold. does that mean? I don't know, but I felt Are you like a gymnast. It, I felt yes. He actually is because I was just getting into gymnastics. Are you serious? Did you do gymnastics? I did. I did palm horse. Okay. I did the rings. That's why my oh, upper so body you need, like really good upper body strength. Yeah, that's why my upper body is really ripped, but my lower body is not so much. Oh, interesting. I have no strength whatsoever. I just I'm made just all like, of that up. The fact that you oh, think I did gymnastics. I, listen, it, people contain multitudes. I just told you I played field hockey in the cross. I like, know, but when you true. when I said my mom said go for the gold, you, the only thing that mattered in your life was gymnastics. There's no other thing you can win gold in. You're just like, oh, you're a gymnast? <laughs> you're a gymnast. You must... My dad told me when he dropped me off. But, he said, I don't want to hear that you eat cheap food or drink cheap liquor because only cheap women drink cheap liquor. Oh, interesting. Have fun in college. <laughs> interesting parting words from yeah. your dad. No cheap is... shoes, no cheap food, no oh, cheap what? liquor. Oh, interesting. Those are like the th- Have you held like, to that? Like, you don't eat cheap food? Oh, no, no. no. Mm-hmm. I was the person in college where everyone's buying Boone's Farm or whatever. And I'm like, how about we all pool our money together and get this nice $40 bottle of wine? <laughs> Interesting. How about we all like, and I hung out with certain guys that actually, granted, they like Jägermeister and things like that, but like they would actually. <laughs> they had some good taste. But like the alcohol that they drank was not plastic bottle alcohol. It was right. like top shelf alcohol. If we were going to drink rum or vodka or tequila or whatever. What yeah, is your drink like, now? What do I drink now? What is your drink now? Your drink. What is your I'm a, drink? I'm a gin person. That's right. I'm an old British lady. Or champagne. <laughs> I drink champagne. This is why I don't drink during Lent. 46 days. That's right. You, I knew this. Mm-hmm. I haven't had a drink since Valentine's Day. Oh, wow. Because that's Ash Wednesday. And inter- then I do sober September because it's the beginning of school. And yeah. that's when you want to have a drink when you come home. Like, ah, the beginning of the semester. So I just do clip soda in September. Wow. That's impressive. That's impressive. Most you- people do sober October, but it's no sober September is when I need to do. Do you feel like you want to have a drink? It's been how many days? I don't know how many days. It ends on Easter. I'm always drunk on Easter. I'm a light <laughs> switch. It's I don't think about it. I literally turn that's the good. light switch off. It's I'm not impressive. drinking now. Unfortunately. When I turn the light switch back on, it's, don't you sleep better? Don't you feel it's better? Good. Isn't this wonderful? And I'm like, maybe I do. I don't know. It's just a light switch. I'm just not drinking. And then March 31st, Shining bright. <laughs> you might get some texts. It's Chrissy, is this you? It's like, I'm <laughs> Rod, not again at 3 a.m. <laughs> All right. All right. 
Let me ask you more political science things, shall we? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Not my drinking habits. Uh, how, how closely are you paying attention to the Supreme Court and and what what they have done, what they have heard this term, and what your concerns are about how they've handled the Trump stuff and kicked that down the can? I feel yeah. like when we come to politics, we have to always think a lot about what the high, the all the courts really are are decided. How much time do you spend thinking about that, and lately specifically? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't spend a ton of time looking at the court because for me, they're a 6-3 court. So it's my blood pressure is already up yeah. on on what Congress is going to do and the presidential election. I'm like, the court is the court. We knew that when these cats got in there. So it's I just assume everything's going to be 6-3. And if it's occasionally a 5-4 that goes in a direction that doesn't destroy this country, I'm like, ooh, that's nice. But I'm pretty much banking on the the court working against all the strides that we've made. When I feel like come November, it's going to be the same narrative that it's been, and maybe even more so, that women's reproductive rights are motivating people that aren't necessarily even paying attention to politics. And that's really going to be a huge thing. Now, this issue with IVF, that crosses a lot of intersections of people who are interested in having that opportunity and resource available to them. How much do you think that issue will be animating voters is it now and throughout the summer? And should Democrats be hammering on abortion, reproductive rights, IVF now till November right. 5th? All politics is local. So like you have to think about the district that would be like really resonant. And so like in October, when they've had off season elections, it's been a really resonant issue. Right. And like it's been a galvanizing issue for young people. And that's men and women. Right. Because the thing is, I think. Democrats are banking on Republicans overplaying their hand, as they tend to do sometimes. The country, by and large, is like leaning towards what would be, quote unquote, democratic issues. It's just they don't know how to sell them. Like the country, by and large, believes in marriage equity. The country, by and large, believes in a woman's right to choose. The problem is Democrats just adopt Republican talking points. So they're still using this antiquated language of like pro-life and pro-choice. I'm like, we're not talking about pro-life. Stop using that phrase, Democrats. We're talking about ant right to choose, pro-choice or anti-choice. We're literally saying, can a grown woman make a, ch a decision for her own self and her body and her family? So Republicans aren't pro-life. They sentence people to death constantly. They starve children, not just at the border, but in our own country. That's not pro-life. Stop using it. So the marketing of ideas or lack thereof by Democrats is just so frustrating. So yeah, IVF isn't like a democratic issue because all these Christian fundamentalists believe in having a gaggle of children and keeping women barefoot and pregnant. So if you can't do that, you need IVF. Like so many communities, if you don't have a child, you're not considered like a real woman. So IVF is something that people might not talk about out in the open, but a lot of women are using it and a lot of women need it for various things. And if you want to have a family, you should be able to have a family, period. So I think that's an overplaying of the hand that the Republicans in Alabama didn't think all the way through because you've got the court saying, no, let's take everything away from women. They hate women so much. But you even have Republican electeds who are like, that may be a bridge too far because my constituents want to have that ninth kid. Let's let them do that. You even have Donald Trump who has no, he's got no compass. He was pro-choice for a long time. And then when he needed white evangelicals, he's, oh yeah, sure. I'm pro-life, whatever that is, whatevs. You can't really count right. on him <laughs> to be the stalwart for whatever your issue is. But I do think that a woman's right to choose, because, hey, here's the thing. This is always my question. You want to start all these like a human being is at six weeks. No, it's at 15 weeks. No, it's at birth. It's at inception. So it's OK. So can I sue you for child support the second I find out I'm pregnant? Can I sue you for child support with these little embryos in this petri yeah, what dish is, over what's, here? It's a slippery slope. Like, what, 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 hey, what, yeah. what are we doing here? And so then I think it's not just a woman being shackled with a baby that they may not be able to responsibly. That's the thing. A lot of people are like, I, res I responsibly cannot take care of this person, right. whether it's financially, whether it's physically, whether it's mentally and emotionally, I just can't do it. Listen, I have friends who are OBGYNs who have performed abortions on women who have three kids and they're like, I just can't have a fourth. And that's, and they have kids. Like lots of women use abortion for different things. And this is How what about if they have one kid with a guy and they're like, I can't have another one with this guy. Yeah. I mean, hey, listen, that's the only reason. 
That's, Anything's a hey, fine reason to you me. Know, but. Anything is a fine reason. Honestly, yeah. it is. If if it's just not for you, it's not for you. I think what would be helpful is if more men actually were vocal about supporting a woman's right to choose and framing it that way, where it's just like, guess what? For all the conversations we can have about, oh, men will be supportive. Says who? Like, and also putting your a whole human ass being comes out yeah. of your body. Like, I just have I, I, at this point, I'm not, I'm not sure how to talk about it because I just that issue now having my daughters be 19 and 16 and, and seeing everything through their eyes, really. And just thinking it just is so audacious to me mm-hmm. that you would right. think that anybody would think that they're going to tell, including me, obviously, my daughter anything other than give them love and comfort and advice and support right. and all the resources that they uh, will need. It's right. just the idea that I, I it just uh, makes my skin crawl. All right. Quick lightning round for you. Are you ready? Okay. Right. I love it. You can pass or you can no. say a few words. It's called, I'm making this up as I go along, a few words with Dr. Christina Greer. <laughs> and we might see Chrissy Greer. We may not. Here it is. Ready? Do you mm-hmm. have any thoughts or feelings on this TikTok controversy? Do you TikTok? I don't TikTok. Any thoughts on it being banned? Are you worried? If it were, if it went away tomorrow, how would you feel? I think it's a slippery slope banning things like that. Speaking of bans, the latest on book bans, whether it be Florida or the teaching of history, any are you paying attention to that? Oh, of course. We've always had tacit book bans, but yep. this one is an assault. And as someone who's a trustee of the Mark Twain House, and I believe mm-hmm. in literature, especially when you look at the books that are being banned, mainly women of color, women, and immigrant authors. It's deliberate to is, erase our history. Is the book To Kill a Mockingbird problematic nowadays with the whole white savior theory? No, I think it's You're still okay useful. It. I, listen, I don't think the problem is the books. I think the problem is teachers not being adequately trained to ah, teach said books. Right. What uh, thoughts uh, quickly on Joe Biden's State of the Union speech? I thought it was excellent. Gave it an A minus. You gave it an A minus. Mm-hmm. I thought the opening was killer. You're talking about. Civil War, you're talking about World War II and like dangers abroad, and then you hit Republicans with a Ronald Reagan quote. It's kicking the teeth. I loved it. It's like just gangbusters, first 90 seconds. Did you wrestle in high school? <laughs> no, just with my sister and my cousins. Glow. Oh, I'm looking Gorgeous at ladies wrestling. I'm looking, all champions in the ring. <laughs> I'm looking at this tweet that says you're yeah, ahead of your someone time. Someone thought I really did wrestle. I loved yeah. wrestling. I loved wrestling. Pro wrestling. I used to watch WWF and like Junkyard Dog. Yes, favorite wrestler? Junkyard Dog. Junkyard Dog. I tried to do the Junkyard Dance uh, at the War Memorial in Syracuse. I wanted to be invited into the ring. I was sure I would be and he never even made eye contact with me. Glow was my Glow was my favorite. We watched Glow every Saturday morning. Like the remake, I just didn't really get into it as much because it like ruined the nostalgia. But the documentary about the women from Glow is just beautiful. Uh, Finally. (laughs) What's that? Spanish Red was amazing. Are you paying any attention to award shows? It's been award season. Do you watch them? No, I tend to go to the theater all the time. I usually only have seen maybe two of the movies that are nominated for the Oscars. Hmm. So the only movie I saw this season that was like, woof, was Saltburn. I thought it was totally bonkers. That and The Holdovers and American Fiction. This is the most, those are the most movies I've seen in a long time. Usually I just go to the Philharmonic to see movies. That's it. Because I like the live score. But yes. other than that, I never go to them. And movie. also, you're very sophisticated. And finally, are you paying attention to the missing princess? It seems that you might be covertly. Uh, I'm trying not to, but yes, I'm like, hey, are. where are you, girl? Maybe you're in danger. <laughs> Barack Obama's there, so black Twitter. Okay, so here's the thing. Wait, he's, really in a, he's in the UK? He's in the UK meeting at Downing Street. And so everyone's like, he went over there to find that gal. Um, <laughs> I didn't know that's happening. <laughs> here's the thing. The greatest day on Twitter... I know there's a movie coming out about black Twitter, but I think, oh, really? in my opinion, the greatest. Yeah, it's like I don't know, no judging. I just don't know anything about it. But hmm. some documentary is coming out. But for me, the greatest day on black Twitter is the day that the queen died and black Twitter met their Irish cousins. We didn't know that we had Irish cousins, but all of us met. So it's like all the British colonies, black people from British colonies, of which there are many. And then black Americans who are sort of descendants of U.S. chattel slavery, but all this British nonsense because these are just British convicts basically that are here. So black Twitter, which is very robust, and this is before Elon Musk took over Twitter, so it was a great place to be. We met our Irish cousins for the first time, and it was a time because the queen has died. This feels like we are getting close to a family reunion 
with this princess stuff because black Twitter is now slowly but surely hey where is this girl no, she's pledging <laughs> so it's like Harry took his black family and moved to Tyler Perry's house there's <laughs> black Twitter is now slowly starting to weigh in and I'm like oh, are we about to meet our Irish cousins again oh, because that this. was the greatest day I didn't leave the computer oh, that like, is, I didn't know that I thought that was the greatest day ever because yeah. unfortunately Irish Americans and black Americans don't have a relationship that we could, and that's because of white supremacy and competition. But Ireland, (laughs) it wasn't Irish American Twitter, it was Irish Twitter and black Twitter met. met. And it was like the Jamaicans were there and the Ghanaians were there and the black Americans were there, but then also like the Irish were there. Oh, did anybody document that? That moment. I don't know. So this documentary about Black Twitter is like talking about all the great moments of Black Twitter and like the importance of information. But that day, like the memes. And here's the thing. Black people, there's a certain level of decorum you have to have with the dead. Irish Twitter came in like gangbusters. We don't. (laughs) And we were just, (laughs) so you guys are like saying the things that like we're saying, but not saying. And you guys are just like saying it. And so then it was like, well... You ain't wrong. <laughs> so this is like, had, you ain't right, but you I, ain't wrong. Either. I had no um, idea about any of this. Yeah. Um, this much less that day. Barack my Obama was there, gonna, and he's going to find her all. <laughs> he's oh, there looking for that gal. Um, good. Everybody... What they really need, I mean, they just they need Gen Z people like working for them because Gen Z people are just on it. They're so much better. At, the royal family does. Yeah, the, like you can't lie to. Gen Z people. You can't be editing and, pictures and throwing them out at it, Gen Z. They're going to be like, what's that? That's six, six, six fingers. Space. What are you doing? Not that Gen Z it. has unique ability to uh, identify six fingers. <laughs> we all right. should be so. But they were just in two seconds. They're like, this picture is a fake. This, this. I mean, because also they grew up doctoring their pictures. Like that's, yeah. they don't post. All right. I've talked pictures, about it too so much. Good. I had no idea that you oh, had. I'm interest, trying. I'm trying not to. Let's see what happens. But, I'll check hey, in listen, with you. I'll check in with you later. I pulled up to that Buckingham Palace quick, fast, in a hurry. So, Chrissy, you thank you very much for talking to me. It's always <laughs> amazing. I always learn a lot, and I appreciate you so much. I appreciate you, too. Right. Back to work. Hey, that was work. Come on. I loved it. Loved it so much. There you go. Chrissy Greer, Christina Greer, Dr. Christina Greer, forgive me, at Fordham University. And go support her, listen to her podcast, read everything she's writing, follow her on social media. Let her know that you heard her here and you appreciate her joining me in conversation. Whenever she does, we've built a great relationship, and I just – Love being in her classroom every time she joins. So thank you, Chrissy. And thank you for listening and for supporting the show. Hey, if you've never written a review on Apple Podcasts, that's huge. Those numbers matter so, so much. So please, right, go on over there. Or over there? What the hell? What the hell just happened to me? I just become from Chicago. I can't speak anymore. Or Spotify or anywhere else that you listen to it. Write a review, review and promote the show if you can. Thank you very, very much. I'll be back tomorrow with another new one. And I thank you and I love you. And John Carroll is going to take us out.
change was gonna come before the change could begin. They had to stand up. All right, they had to stand up. We got to stand up. We got to look the devil square in the eye. We got to let him know. It is time to go and make it clear when all we hear is a lie. Experiment if you stand up. All right, we got to speak up, we got to reach up and raise your voice in every way you know how. Don't be toes up, you got to show up. Ain't no better time to do it but now. No need to pledge allegiance to no wanton tribe. Rise up, show obedience to the voice inside and listen well and it'll tell you not to run and hide. It says.